Hello everyone, welcome to Drydock episode 163. This week the questions are taken from Guide 218 to the Siegfried class coastal defence ships of the Imperial German Navy and the accompanying Wednesday video on the Washington Naval Treaty. So, let us begin. Leo de Salis asks, would the Tillman designs and other 20-inch armed ships actually have become a legitimate ship built and used had it not been for the Washington and London naval treaties? The Tillmans, no. They were just ridiculous. They were, what could we theoretically build as an absolute maximum? You, the US didn't have the infrastructure or indeed the technology to build, actually build them at the time. Um... When I say the technology, I mean things like the sextuple 16-inch turrets, for example. No one, I mean, at that point, the French were just about working on quads, let alone, you know, six-gun turrets. And, you know, the sheer size and scale of the absolute biggest Tillmans were such that the US Navy would have had to pay an absolute fortune in infrastructure upgrades in order to get the things actually working. That would have ruled out um, the Tillmans being produced. And also, you know, they're just hilariously impractical um, in, for the most part. As far as the possibly the slightly saner earlier Tillman designs and some of the other 20-inch arm designs that came about, like Incomparable, those, if they, we're talking in a no-treaty limit environment, potentially might have been built. Uh, as I've said before, I think 18-inch guns are probably the largest guns that you're going to see in common usage in fleets, even after a no-treaty building race. There'll be a few ships with 20-inch guns. 20-inch guns are marginally viable in the 20s and 30s and 40s, but they would require, unless you're doing something like the A150, the Super Yamatos, with just six in three twins, they have require such a tremendously huge ship with commensurately absolutely massive armor that would be stretching the production not just production capability but the production technology of the time that i think if for any navy even the u.s or royal navy that wanted to have you know more than a single squadron of battleships they'd have to settle for 18 inch armed ships and commensurately armoured. So you might see a few prestige pieces like Incomparable built before everyone looks at them and goes, okay, well, we tried to one-up the 18-inch, but it's just not really industrially practicable at this point. Man Cub WMA asks, what is your favourite warship that served in World War II that is not from the five Washington Treaty signatories or from Germany? And he goes on to mention that that includes uh, the Royal Canadian, Royal Australian Navies, etc. So... We're excluding the British and Imperial navies, the US Navy, the Japanese, French, Italians and Germans, i.e. all the major combatants, which leaves you with basically Russia and a bunch of small, medium-sized navies. Now, there are some very nice designs across those various navies, and I do find a number of them quite attractive. There's a few ships that are also quite good from on an engineering level from what they achieve on a given displacement but in terms of sort of what makes a good warship to me i.e well armed well designed able to go toe to toe with most of its peers and has a really good like life story good action story as much as circumstances of its existence will allow because obviously say royal navy late 19th century not really going to see all that much action i would have to go with the polish destroyer bliskowicza um, which i probably again horrendously mispronounced but you hopefully know which one i'm talking about because it, it ticks all those boxes it's a really good solid destroyer design for the period it's heavily armed it can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the best of everybody else's destroyers it looks pretty good. I do have something of uh, an affection for that kind of rounded superstructure that Polish destroyers have at the, at the period. It looks slightly odd, but it kind of works for them. And it just has a really nice, really um, 
active war record so it has a lot of story to it as well as you know the technical specs so i would say that is probably my overall favorite non washington and germany warship of world war ii Dr. Gull 1888 asks, Can you sum up the damage HMS Valiant received when her dry dock collapsed in 1943? I understand she was knocked out for the rest of the war, yet was still able to limp home. You know, I genuinely don't know if there are any pictures of her in the collapsed dry dock. I know there's a couple of Admiralty documents that are reports on the... either reports on the damage itself or the inquiry that followed um, the collapse of the dry dock. So next time I'm, I'm at the National Archives, I'll probably request those and have a look through, see if anyone took any photos, and there probably will be drawings. But I certainly haven't seen any photos of Valiant in that dry dock in the collapsed state that it's in, at least to my knowledge. Maybe there are, who knows. Um, well, I'll certainly take a look in those documents. In the meantime, have a picture of Valiant in a dry dock as compensation. As far as the damage to Valiant, because it was the dry dock that broke its back and sank underneath it, it wasn't as bad as, say, Valiant coming off of its stocks or anything. So water rushed up, but Valiant was impacted by the uneven dry dock as it went down. Now, as far as exactly what damage was caused, the various resources I've been able to look up do vary slightly. Everyone agrees that the steering gear and the propulsion were damaged. Some accounts mention also that some of her stern hull plating was damaged. Um, some say that her entire steering was damaged. Some say that only one of the rudders was damaged. Some say that three screws were jammed. One was fixable and two weren't, which were the two that would later be cut off. Others just say that it was two screws that were jammed and had to be removed later on. So... You can get from that kind of a minimum of one rudder and two screws jammed, a maximum of the steering completely shot, three screws jammed and damaged the hull plating. And the truth is probably somewhere in between. But again, it will be a case of when I go and have a look at those documents in the archives. Well, hopefully there'll be some photos, but hopefully they'll also mandate and lay out exactly what the damage actually was. Joe Brown asks, were armoured conning towers ever a good idea? I'm confused as to where this idea came from and what the designers could have been thinking if conning towers were so obviously useless on later battleship designs. Conning towers, when they first came about, used to make a good deal of sense. And you've got to bear in mind that the armoured conning tower comes in pretty much as soon as the armoured ship does. HMS Warrior has an armoured conning tower, and so does almost everything else after her. Back in the day when you were talking about either solid shot or contact detonation high explosive shells, as well as you know, bits of shrapnel flying around and such like, and you know, not tremendous accuracy from guns in terms of, well, we hit the ship somewhere, that's probably good enough. They did make a certain degree of sense. Um, you didn't want your sort of command crew being taken out by a stray shell or random uh, cannonball or or solid shot that might come rumbling along. And if you had a fairly heavily built armoured conning tower, it could resist those kinds of things because, you know, a low water detonation from a 1860s, 1870s high explosive shell spattering itself across the conning tower, yep that's a lot better than you know it hitting the the crew and detonating and a solid shot again of that era with that kind of level of kinetic energy it might ring the thing like a bell but you again probably get away with it especially because a lot of the early towers were like the armor belts quite heavily backed up with teak and or other anti-spool measures as you go forward through the 19th century and you hit the era of the secondary battery where everyone's thinking about hail of fire, again, it makes sense. Smaller shells, a heavily armoured conning tower can resist those relatively well. Lots of shrapnel, again, conning tower resists those fairly well. Where it begins to no longer make sense is once you enter the era of long-range, long-barrel, heavy main gap caliber guns so 12 inch pre-dreadnought guns for example 
because now these shells have so much kinetic energy and an explosive payload and they are the primary thing that's going to hit you that whilst a conning tower might provide you with a certain degree of protection against shrapnel so would a conning tower or just some armor plating on a bridge that's considerably thinner the problem with the conning towers at that point is they're if if they're thick enough to withstand a shell and that's not always the case just look at the swiss cheese that's left from a bismarck's conning tower but even if they are as I've explained before in other videos, the very small confined space that they're in and the sheer amount of kinetic, both kinetic and explosive energy they're having to deal with means that if you if a, you take a solid hit to the conning tower, even if the armor resists it, you're going to have one of two things happen to you, and possibly both. One, because it's a very small confined space, shrapnel is going to spool off of the inside of the conning tower and is then going to ping around inside like a blender whereas you know on an armor belt well a armor belts are even at this point still usually backed up with wood and b they are on the outside of the ship quite a distance away from almost everybody and there's plenty of space internally to absorb a few small spooled splinters but not so much in a conning tower. And secondly, you know, it's going to ring the thing like a bell. It's not necessarily going to have a nice tone to it, but the concussive shock wave that's going to come through, to say nothing of potentially any sort of bursts of fire, etc., is also going to do a number on people, possibly even just kill them by the shock wave, even if you don't get spalling. Um, and so at that point, they've kind of, surpass their purpose so i would say the armored conning tower is a good idea right up until something around about the start of the 20th century the battle of tsushima kind of points out a lot of the problems with conning towers thereafter i'd say they're more trouble than they're worth rupert falmouth asks in the early days of sail, there was little difference between a military and civilian vessel. Many merchant ships could mount the same kind, if not the same number of cannon as a true combat ships. When did it become generally illegal to mount military-grade weapons on a private vessel? Uh, if a ship today were to stay in international waters and could somehow gain access to naval guns, could they mount them without being arrested or sunk for their troubles? This assumes the ship behaves itself and doesn't go all piratey. It's a much later and much messier process than you might otherwise think. Technically speaking, unless there's a specific statute on the books for a specific country, most merchant vessels today could still, in theory, be armed in international waters. The problem these days is more the fact, not that it's illegal per se, as I say, unless there is a specific statute on a specific nation's book, it's more the fact that most countries these days will refuse entry to a vessel that is armed or carries significant numbers of armed personnel unless it's, you know, an officially flagged naval vessel. Which, if you're a merchant ship trying to go from port to port and the port's saying, no, you can't come in because you have guns aboard, or missiles these days, I suppose, that is a little bit of a problem. But, in theory... If you could find a home port and a port to trade with, that neither of which had any problem with you arming your merchant vessel, and that was the only trade route you were going to do, technically speaking, you could still arm your merchant ship today. Um, I say, aside from specific national regulations, um, if you happen to want to carry a specific flag. What tended to happen when it came to armed merchant ships is that up to round about the conclusion of the Napoleonic Wars, Almost everybody armed their merchant ships, and often quite heavily. But as the so-called Pax Britannica set in and the Royal Navy was hoovering up pirates left, right and centre, the number of guns started to decrease because the chances of running into um, pirates started to decrease. And then eventually you got, uh, by the middle of the 19th century, you got a lot of merchant ships that just weren't carrying guns at all. Um, they might be fitted to be able to carry them if they were sent, if they owners knew that they were going to send them to particularly dangerous waters, but generally they wouldn't be. And then by the time you got round to the 20th century, 
it was just kind of taken as read that ships weren't typically armed. The thing was, at that point, you had the issue that so there were certain rules of war now coming in and treaties saying, well, if a ship is armed this way, you can do this to it. If it's not armed, you have to stop and search it and so on and so forth. And so there was a incentive to keep ships unarmed. But they did consider rearming merchant vessels in the late 1900s and early 1910s as a matter of course. And it turned out most people didn't particularly mind, even though it was a little bit unusual. Then obviously you get World War One breaking out. You have armed merchant ships left, right and centre and um, Q ships and our merchant cruisers and that kind of thing. And then it kind of all goes away again, because one of the things you've got to bear in mind is obviously if you're going to have an armed vessel, that armed vessel has to carry the guns, which have weight. They have to carry the explosive, which have weight and hopefully safety procedures, take up volume. You have to have the crew to man them and, tra and trained to use them. So that involves time and expense. All of this involves time, expense and potentially lost cargo space. And merchant shipping, as long as they don't need to have the weapons, won't have the weapons. And then obviously it comes back again in World War II. And then goes away again after World War II, with again a few minor exceptions here and there. But this is why you have this sort of constant debate about whether or not merchant ships going near some modern pirate vested areas should be armed or not. It's again partially an argument over how much the actual owners of the ship want to pay and also an argument over where they can dock as far as i understand it and there may be one or two people who are maritime legal experts who may be able to offer some correctional clarification but technically speaking as far as i understand it if you're sailing under certain flags there wouldn't outside of cost be any particular restriction in say coming across a 20 mil or 30 mil cannon emplacement in installing it on your ship in international waters in order to pass through say near Somalia and if you've got another ship uh, owned by that line coming back the other way and you've got a helicopter you could then move that gun onto the other ship and so you leave port as an unarmed merchant ship, you enter port as an unarmed merchant ship, but in international waters you may have been temporarily armed against pirates. I think that's technically still legal. It's just very expensive, and that's mainly why they don't do it. But, again, let me know in the comments below if you happen to know what modern maritime law says. Certainly that would have, well, without the helicopter part, that would have been perfectly fine in the 1910s and 1920s. LC Requiem. Is it possible to convert a distributed armour scheme to an all-or-nothing armour scheme? Were all-or-nothing schemes considered by Britain or Germany for their dreadnoughts or battlecruisers pre the launch of the Nevada class? As far as the British or Germans considering all-or-nothing prior to the launch of the Nevada class, well, bear in mind that effectively the all-or-nothing scheme was the default armour scheme Back in the days of the Ironclads, the distributed armour scheme had grown out of the fear of the hail of fire, mostly, um, in the late 19th century. So, in a way, the all-or-nothing armour scheme was a reversion back to the original armour schemes of ships like Warrior. But, um, in terms of early dreadnoughts and battlecruisers in the British and German navies, I'm not aware of any major design studies that said we need to look into this um, they were to a certain extent still worried about um, high explosive shells even from large caliber guns the British uh, especially looking at things like CPC shells which they had and uh, thinking that well maybe other people also had in terms of is it possible to convert a distributed armor scheme to an all-or-nothing armor scheme yes it is possible um, but which part of the armour scheme you're redistributing is kind of the driving factor as to how complex a thing you're looking at. Because the distributed armour scheme isn't just the belt, it's also where the deck armour protection. Now, the deck armour protection is much, much harder to do because the armour decks are obviously fairly low down in the ship. They're under several other actual full decks. So to rejig a distributed armour deck scheme into a all or nothing deck basically takes a full modernization or rebuild which is 
you know, kind of what you get with things like the Queen Elizabeth class. As far as the side armor is concerned, because in World War One that's generally mounted on the exterior of the vessel, that is a little bit easier. You will still need a fairly extensive refit to do it, but it's a lot less complicated, at least in terms of physical practicality. You will have to do a lot of calculations to work out the new stresses on the ship because you're changing not just the overall weight but the distribution of that weight and where that's going to load the ship and where it's not going to load the ship where the ship's going to be more buoyant as a result but you can do that paperwork calculation while the ship is in service so at that point in in its most simple you could remove the thinner plates from elsewhere in the distributed armor scheme and then enhance the depth of your primary belt uh, maximum thickness with an upper or lower strake depending on where you needed to put it of the same thickness which would then increase the overall protection of that section of the ship um, using the, the weight that you've saved from elsewhere alternatively if for whatever reason you're happy with the overall dimensions and location of the main thickness of your armor belt already you could at potentially greater expense even remove that and replace that with an even thicker armor belt so for example when you look at um the refit options for hms hood the ones that the one that seems to be the most sensible would be to remove the five inch and seven inch armor strakes above as well as some of the end end plates, and put in an additional 12-inch plate above the existing 12-inch plate, thus making Hood have still 12-inch inclined armour over a considerably greater area. You could, in theory, also, if you wanted to, although this wouldn't have been as good an idea, removed the 12-inch plate as well, basically remove all the side armour plate, and then installed, I don't know, a 14-inch inclined armour plate or something like that over roughly the same area as the 12 inch plate but part of the thing that that was meant to the reef it was meant to address was the fact the seven inch plate was useless but also you know covered an area that could be a vital entry point for shells so this is why you generally prefer to expand your existing main belt thickness rather than increase your main belt thickness in such conversion mihai asks what is your favorite heroic act of an individual serving on a warship there are so many to choose from, but I think for both the simplicity and the sheer courage involved, there's one incident that stands out to me in the Crimean War um, in, in the 1850s. So the situation is British ship of the line, um, merrily bombarding away at Russian positions, Russian positions merrily firing back and the Russian positions fire and in comes a shell now bear in mind this is an early type of shell it literally has a fuse that you can see burning um, crashes in aboard the British ship and suddenly everyone sat there going well this could be a problem because there's a very big explosive shell that's about to detonate and we can see the fuse going and that's going to be very bad for us because you know we're a wooden warship most people would probably freeze in place to be honest some people who wouldn't freeze in place would probably run like hell because that's a fairly sensible decision um it's you know it's a socking great explosive shell you know doing the captain america throw yourself on the grenade thing is not really going to help anybody and then along comes a royal navy sailor as we know from the dispatches where he's mentioned for bravery and gets a very well deserved medal for takes one look at this thing and goes no, I reject your reality and substitute my own. Picks up the shell, despite the fact, you know, it's still quite hot because it's just been fired at you. And walks over to the side of the ship and lobs it over the side of the ship. And away you go. And obviously, shell, I can't recall offhand if it either fizzles out, the fuse fizzles out in the water or if it does a low order detonation. But basically, the ship is saved. So, yeah, in, in all this chaos and confusion... His first instinct when looking at, you know, several dozen pounds of high explosive that could potentially detonate any second is just to walk up with it and go, nope, I do not want you here. Go away and throw it over the side of the ship. That's a pretty crazy level of heroism there. And it's also relatively simple, which I quite like. It's like you're either going to do it or not. 
there, there's not a tremendous amount of um, complex thinking going into that particular equation. So I think that is my favourite heroic act, personally. I was like, there's plenty of others, but that one, I think, always, has always stood out to me. Grimtooth asks... In the run-up to World War One, Germany decides not to try to match the British Grand Fleet, instead building a small coastal defence fleet. All the money that would otherwise have been spent on the high seas fleet is instead wasted on moustache wa wax and sausages, so it's not available for any other military use. Everything else proceeds as historically, Britain still joins World War I. Is there anything the Royal Navy could do to significantly impact the outcome now that it doesn't have a large enemy fleet to worry about? Yes, in theory. I mean, mines and submarines are probably still going to make a close approach to the German coast um, considerably not fun for the Royal Navy. However, they can devote a lot more ships to the blockade, so the blockade itself will be considerably tighter, which means Germany is going to run out of resources um, sooner. Without submarines, and therefore without the need for without long-range submarines, and therefore without the need for convoys and convoy escorts. You've also got a lot more destroyers and other older ships available. You've also got significant chunks of the Grand Fleet available, so potentially elements of the Grand Fleet might go to back up the Aust the uh, Italians and the French in trying to deal with the Austro-Hungarian Navy. The Dardanelles, the Gallipoli operations, are probably going to see considerably more Royal Navy presence. So instead of sending in a bunch of pre-dreadnoughts, to be honest, they probably still will send a bunch of pre-dreadnoughts, but they'll be backed up by a bunch of full-scale dreadnoughts with much more destructive firepower, as well as, you know, mine-sweeping efforts, etc., etc. The sheer weight of fire probably suppressing the Ottoman defences. And, I mean, taking out the Ottomans from uh, World War One, quite a significant achievement. Um, strangling the German economy a bit ha harder and faster. Again, achievement. Um, probably dedicating more firepower to operating off of the uh, the coast of Europe on the Dover patrol, shelling German positions. It's not really going to turn the Western Front too much, but it might it might help a little bit. So that's probably an achievement there. Freer flow of goods into Britain means, you know, fewer shortages, a um, little bit better organisation, so that's an achievement there. Um, more of the German colonies probably get wrapped up a lot faster. Um, some of the stuff, obviously, in the land campaigns, again, the Navy can't affect too much, but the, with the German colonies overall falling quicker, that means more troops, again, freed up for operations in other areas, such as in, in Europe. So... Yeah, overall, the ancillary theatres of the war probably get wrapped up pretty darn quickly within a year or two, and there will be a lot heavier pressure on the Germans, which means that overall, resource-wise, and um, etc., they might actually, the war might be over by 1917, optimistically. QA Library asks, Why did nations not just totally cheat or just walk away from the Washington Naval Treaty? Who was going to say you're treating, cheating and enforce the rules? Part of it was basically the powers that could properly afford to cheat or walk away, i.e. Britain and America, were the ones who wanted the treaty. So they had a good incentive to stick to it. Everybody else couldn't afford to if they wanted to anyway, because, as I've said before, France and Italy didn't build up to their displacement limits, or even close to. In fact, both of their navies actually regressed away from their displacement limits for a while during the economic difficulties of the 20s and then the Great Depression. The Japanese had the industry, but had nowhere near the finances. Um, so they weren't going to be doing anything anytime soon even though they didn't like it and they did aim event they did eventually decide they were going to cheat on the treaty once their their economy had recovered a little bit um they still weren't going to walk away from it immediately um until they thought they had a position of strength now when it comes to cheating the treaty that is an entirely different thing everybody in almost immediately in most cases cheated on the treaty in some way shape or form so and later on as well so i mean the 
Italians, for example, cheated by just lying about the displacement of some of their ships. The reason the Goriza is here is because she was one of the ways, she was the thing that clued everyone in to the fact that Italy was cheating. Because she got damaged, she had to go into a British dry dock, and while she was in the dry dock, the uh, people, the, the British naval architects, took a look at her underwater lines, did a few calculations, and went, that hull, there is no way that hull displaces 10,000 tons. Um, it's a lot heavier than that. So that was them, and uh, the Japanese, as we know, they were restricted they'd come up with the uh, up to the limit of what their heavy cruisers were so they built the Megamis with the specific intention and design of swapping them out with from triple six to double eight to make heavy cruisers um, they also lied about displacement uh, eventually when it turned out you couldn't build to the displacement with hilariously heavy weapons out lo loadouts and really light superstructures the americans pretty much cheated to a certain degree from the get-go, when you look at the true displacement of the Lexingtons and the, the, the fudge factors and the twisting of meanings that they did to get those in, um, the British cheated in a couple of ways. Um, the British did a very kind of elegant cheat in as much as they explicitly made sure that things like, you know, feed water weren't included and then immediately went and put something that was technically could be counted as feed water in as part of the torpedo defense system on the Nelsons. And as I've said before, um, the counties, whilst they had varying stages of refit depending on what they could do, and also at the time some of the earlier armor refits for the counties were uh, done when the, the British were still trying to follow the treaty system, but more generally speaking, when you look at the counties, they have this box protection and then for the for the magazines and then you look in between and you go well there, there's a awfully suspiciously ni nice neat gap there and if you look at almost any photograph of a county class in the interwar period they are riding suspiciously high you, know, you look at a, a pensacola or a new orleans or uh, a duquesne or even the zaras or the trentos etc or even to be honest even the towns the arethuses the leanders pretty much any other cruiser that's built in the interwar period look into war photos of them and sometimes they're riding high sometimes they're riding at the waterline sometimes they're riding a little below the waterline depending on how they're loaded out whereas the vast majority of photos of the counties in the interwar period they are riding significantly high which indicates at least to me that Somebody was designing those ships to be able to be loaded down considerably more than they actually were. And then suspiciously, when you look at wartime, early wartime photos of some of the refitted counties where they now have a continuous uh, main belt from magazine covering the machinery to the other magazine, now they're riding suspiciously around about where you'd expect them to ride at wartime load with them and the waterline. Obviously, some of them do start riding a little bit deeper when lots of extra gubbins get added on and London's refit, which is much more comprehensive than just bolting in armour plate, doesn't go quite to plan. But, it, yeah, it's it's a, it's more than a little suspicious, shall we say. So, yeah, people came up with inventive ways of either cheating or building in cheats to their ships for use later on. But in terms of enforcing the rules, basically, so the main enforcement of the rules was that the small powers couldn't afford to break the rules and kick off the building race again. The larger powers didn't particularly want to immediately break the rules. And the kind of the implicit enforcement was if anyone is caught breaking the rules, well, then that voids certain elements of the treaty, which then means that everybody else that you're trying to compete against can do the same thing. And unless you're Britain or America, that means the people that you're competing against will outbuild you. So what's the point? The new IKB 4472 asks, what under the treaties counted as disarming, decommissioning, rendering no longer warlike a ship? So this is contained in section 2, part 3, section B of... Um, the Washington Naval Treaty, which is the rules for scrapping vessels of war, is part two as a as a whole. So part two, section three, part B reads as follows. 
A vessel shall be considered incapable of further warlike service when there shall have been removed and landed, or else destroyed in the ship, 1. All guns and essential portions of guns, fire control tops and revolving parts of all barbettes and turrets, 2. All machinery for working hydraulic or electric mountings, 3. All fire control instruments and rangefinders, 4. All ammunition, explosives and mines, 5. All torpedoes, warheads and torpedo tubes, 6. All wireless telegraphy installations, 7. The conning tower and all side armour, or alternatively all main propelling machinery, and 8. All landing and flying off platforms or other aviation accessories. Now, with the London Treaty, the rules for training ships were slightly different. You could t take a ship down to train ship without quite all of that. But you can see that initial part where it's they have to be removed and landed or else destroyed. This is how the Japanese managed to get one of the Congos as a training vessel whilst also being able to put it back into warlike service pretty soon because the guns and their mountings and their moving parts were all taken off. Um, fire control instruments removed, ammunition obviously removed, uh, the wireless telegraphy stuff they could argue to have back in because it was as a training vessel, and the conning tower and the side armour, again, that could be removed um, again as a training vessel, there are a few exceptions to that, landing and flying off platform, same thing, and so they could disarm a Congo and basically use it as a gigantic private yacht for a bit, but in what they should have put into the treaty was removed and disposed of rather than just removed and landed because the Japanese just made a slight, not even particularly slightly creative interpretation of that and just stuck it all in a warehouse ready to put back on again at some point in the future, which of course they did. Zach Scheid asks, excluding technology levels, as far as just number of combat hulls is concerned, who do you think would win an arms race of number of capable ships being built between the US Navy at its peak, I probably late World War II era, and the Royal Navy at its peak, probably the build up to the World War One era? So I think it depends on how you're counting you know, warlike hulls. If you're looking purely at numbers of hulls built, i.e. how many ships that are armed with guns can a nation kick out the US at its peak late World War II ship production is going to walk away with it because they invented a whole load of brand new relatively when I say small capacity I don't mean by numbers but by size of vessel um, shipyards just to build things like escort carriers and destroyers and such like in addition to all the other stuff that they were building. So, yeah, the, the US Navy in late World War II can just churn out hulls like it's going out of fashion. However, if, you, if you're talking specifically about capital ships, battleships and such, then I think the Royal Navy in the build-up to the World War I era is going to win that one, mainly because of the restrictions in the num number of shipyards that could actually build battleships in the US in World War II and it's not just the size of the dry dock it's also the infrastructure for installing things like guns and such but also the bottlenecks with things like gun heavy naval gun production and such like because the US never had to go into the kind of full bore long-term naval arms building race that the Royal Navy did and also, bear in mind, British shipyards at that point were also building for foreign yards, foreign navies. In terms of the greatest number of battleships building at any one point, the US had eight, as far as I can tell, building at, at one point simultaneously, which was the um, South Dakotas and some of the, the first four Iowas were all on the stocks at the same time. And that's near enough, as I can tell, the peak of U.S. capital shipbuilding. Whereas during the run-up to World War One, at any given time over about a four to five year period, the British were averaging having about a dozen capital ships on the stocks at any given time. And that includes obviously foreign orders. But the thing you've got to bear in mind there is that that was even with that naval arms race 
you had shipyards either going out of business or downsizing because their yards, capable of building capital ships, weren't getting any orders. So there was a lot more spare capacity there, and it was a similar story with the gun manufacturers. Now, granted, obviously in the States, you in late World War II, you had aircraft carriers being built as well, but the rather specialist infrastructure for some of the machinery and um, gun and armor installs that you have to do for battleships are slightly different um, and you know as we know from the Alaskas being delayed things were somewhat maxed out in some regards so in terms of pure shipyard space maybe mid to late World War II America might have might have slightly more long shipyards capable of taking the hulls but in terms of the bottleneck of manufacturing things like the guns and other big long lead items that are very niche to battleships i think build up to world war one britain has the advantage there in terms of just pure how many numbers can we crank out well without well, without obviously with because of the question we're not looking at the specific combat power of each unit Jonathan Smith asks, in the C.S. Forrester novel The Ship, there's a scene where it describes preparing food during a short break from action stations, and how normal stoves couldn't be used as their oil fuel had been drained below for combat, but a superheated steam jet was available to heat a cauldron of soup. This got me wondering, for various navies in World War II, what kind of kitchen stove heat source did they use? Electric, natural gas, fuel oil, etc. And what did the kitchens have to do to make the area safe for action stations? So for the most part, the stoves and other such things in ships' galleys in World War II would be either oil-powered or coal-powered, partly depending on the age of the ship, partly depending on how refitted they'd been, partly depending on what was most readily available, obviously varying on nation. There were even a few that were wood-fired rather than coal-fired. In general, for warships... Uh, overall but especially world war ii gas power would never be used uh, partly because it would be practically the only place on the ship that would then have compressed explosive gas on board um in any significant quantity and you know that's probably not a good thing to have aboard a ship it's very going to be quite dangerous whereas inert coal is relatively safe oil okay it's not the safest but you know, as mentioned in the, the novel, it can be drained and put elsewhere. There's lots of different oil-based products aboard a ship already. Everything from fuel for the ship's boats all the way up to, you know, fuel for the ship itself and everything in between. So that element they didn't worry quite so much about. And of course, in some areas, depending on if the ship has a lot of power generation or if there's a special circumstance, you might use electricity instead. Uh, for example, submarines, you can't really have a ongoing coal or oil powered galley in a submarine because you're going to use up all the oxygen internally very quickly. So they would have electric powered appliances and some of the more modern ships equipped would also have electric powered appliances because that eliminated the need to store additional fuel for the stoves generally. Uh, albeit obviously a slight increase in fuel, in fuel usage in the engines because you're drawing the power from somewhere. And it also meant that there wasn't, at least for oil-powered stuff, there wasn't the prospect of accidentally having petroleum-based products around the ship's galley if the ship was in action and took damage, which you know, was something you always wanted to try and avoid. Although, amusingly enough, the prevalence of gas-powered stoves and other heating elements ashore meant that every so often some genius who'd just been recruited into the Navy would be assigned galley duty and try to light an oil-powered oven the way that you'd light a gas oven and um, that usually ended rather comically and with a large explosion. Bill Luster asks, in your opinion which major warships became significantly more or less visually attractive over their careers, i.e. adding Queen Anne, Pagoda or South Dakota style superstructures to World War I battleships seem to work aesthetically and functionally but there must have been some sail to steam Frankenstein's monsters out there. Now I do like the Queen Anne's mentions, um, and I really like what was done with some of the US capital ships in their refits in World War II as well. I am not a fan of cage masts, so anything that involves replacing the cage masts with not cage masts in my book is a good thing. 
personally, I'm not quite as sold on the Pagoda Mast. I understand why they were put in. There are reasons for it. But they some of them do look a little bit silly to the point of absurdity to me. So I wouldn't necessarily say a Pagoda is an aesthetic improvement when it comes to things, even if it was a functional improvement. But yes, there were also some rather abominable sail to steam conversions take for example here hms royal sovereign it would originally have been a first rate ship of the line they look pretty nice and then as you would have heard in the uh, first 10 years of royal navy ironclads video it was cut down and converted into the royal navy's first turret ship okay technologically fine it's probably more useful in the battle line but it's ugly as sin <laughs> it's a it's a iron tub with no particular sense of aesthetic or lines the funnel is in such a weird position and the whole shape is so odd you're not entirely sure whether it's coming or going in any given picture that doesn't have you know a, a trail of smoke to indicate where it should be and at the other end of the ironclad era some not all but some of the upgrades modernizations where they would remove the sailing rig from certain ships i think also don't really work aesthetically now some ships they would give a more substantial superstructure to upgrade the guns give it a new paint job and those actually do look pretty good it's actually surprising how much you can make a early ironclad look like a vaguely modern late 19th century vessel if you try but because of the fact that they had sails, they're often built without much, if anything, in the way of superstructure. And occasionally, those conversions almost literally consist of take away the masts. So you end up with this, what effectively looks like a an incomplete ship, because it just looks like a hull with a funnel and maybe the smallest of bridges which is almost literally just a small bridge in the sense of a thing to walk on and they're just kind of puttering around looking for all the world like a freshly launched ship that still has to go through fit out so those sometimes didn't work particularly well either rebel Squirrel asks given the penny pinching character of congress in the late 19th century did the u.s navy consider op adopting a jeune école fleet mix in the 1890s as a strictly coastal defense force Yes, this is exactly what the US Navy was thinking of doing initially in the early 1890s, and it's where we get the USS Olympia from, because at that point the US had concluded that there was no point trying to build comparable cruisers to everybody else, because they just would never be able to build enough of them, and, you know, if you've got... I don't know, a 3,000 ton protected cruiser class, and the US has six, and you go to war with britain or france or someone like that and they have 40 well you're just gonna lose so the idea of ships like olympia this design lineage which unfortunately terminated with olympia was for use of these ships as commerce raiders and the idea was okay if we can't build that many almost in a way looking back at the original us six frigates we'll build them substantially bigger and better than their contemporaries so olympia in a lot of ways, although she is a protected cruiser, could be argued to be able to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with armoured cruisers or even some of the small second-class battleships, despite the fact she is still just a very heavily armed protected cruiser. The thing is, and the reason why Olympia is one of a kind, is that pretty much as she was under construction, the US stopped thinking that way and decided they were going to go after a more conventional battle fleet, in which case you suddenly did need larger numbers of more conventional smaller cruisers rather than a handful of small uh, a handful of powerful one-offs dm phoenix asks this has been a subject for debate for years but could you settle the correct meaning of the an acronym cv for u.s air navy aircraft carrier hull classifications i've heard everything from cruiser volaire cruiser aviation you're using the v from aviation to carrier vessel carrier vol plane carrier victor wing <laughs> aircraft and carrier of vehicles if no such true meaning exists what would you personally prefer to represent cv well for the us they had a bit of a problem when it came to coming up with the hull designation for carriers because the most obvious ones given the 
conversions of various ships, often from battle cruisers or cruisers at the time, would be to use cruiser aviation, which would be CA. But they were already using CA for armoured cruisers. You could try aviation cruiser, AC, but that was already being used for auxiliary colliers. So those two were both out. And so it was like, well, okay, it, it's a cruiser, maybe a carrier, but they both begin with C. Okay, so we're going to have to use C, but we already use C to designate cruiser. So, okay, it's going to be cruiser. But then we, how do we signify aviation in a way that is distinguishable from everything else? And they'd already decided on various letters being used to designate various things already. And so they had to go through the alphabet and find something they hadn't actually given uh, away as a, uh, as a designation for. And you couldn't have it something very specific like fighter or bomber um, because obviously the carrier is going to carry a mixture of, of both or all three if you're talking include torpedo aircraft. And at the same time, with the development of lighter than air airships as uh, military assets, someone in the US Armed Forces had to come up with a way of distinguishing between aircraft that were heavier than air and aircraft that were lighter than air, i.e. fixed-wing aircraft and airships. And out of somewhere, they decided that V should stand for fixed-wing aviation, heavier-than-air assets, whether that's the V taken from the second letter of aviation or whatever. Some people say it's taken from voler or fly for the French, from the French, but to be honest, it would be incredibly weird for that to be a thing because if you look at all the other US designations at the time, they're not derived from French, so why would they randomly go off for French designations at this point? Also, someone, the same person who decided that V stood for heavier than air aircraft, also decided that Z should be the letter for um, lighter than air airships, or Z if you're in America. And I can guarantee you there is no word beginning with Z that designates lighter than air airships in French. I mean, okay, Zeppelin, but that's German. So whilst the US is you know, at, at the, this point is trying to have lots of different immigrants come in. I don't think they're importing two different languages to designate two different types of aircraft in addition to using English for everything else they have in the Navy. So I think it, it's partly just arbitrary. We haven't used these letters yet, so I guess we'll use them before someone else claims them. And partially for the aircraft, I think someone was probably making a play on the V from aviation, although I can't necessarily prove that and so once those separate designators had been arrived at it became logical to have cv because effectively that would then mean it's a cruiser and whereas you've got cl for light cruiser obviously coming on a bit later um, cc which had been the battle cruiser designation um, ca for armored cruiser now you had CV, which would therefore designate a cruiser that was related to heavier-than-air aviation, which is pretty much what the Lexingtons were, and so that's kind of how it rolled out. 22NF2 asks, following from my Q&A question last month, out of all the ships that the Axis and Allies deployed to the Southeast Asian-Indian Ocean waters in 1940-41, which did the most damage to the opposing war machine? Was any ship, crew or captain able to effectively replicate what von Müller had done with the Emden in 1914? That's a rather difficult one because, of course, in 1914-41, which is almost entirely before the attack on Pearl Harbor, there's not a tremendous amount of warships that at least the, the Allies deploy to the area. The British and French, and pretty much everybody is actually withdrawing ships so that they can use them in the war in Europe. The US has a few ships in the Asiatic squadron, but they don't accomplish all that much before they get driven back. And obviously the bulk of the US fleet is still on the other side of the Pacific. So in terms of most successful Allied vessel that was deployed to the Southeast Asian Indian Ocean waters in 4041, you probably something like 016, it's a Dutch submarine, and it 
I mean, it didn't last that long, but during the time that it was active, it did actually manage to pick off either sinking or badly damaging quite a large number of Japanese troop transports, which, you know, those are pretty nice targets and do a lot of damage to an enemy's war effort. So I'd, I'd say 016 for the 4041 time period is probably up there. Um, obviously, there may be one or two ships that were deployed there that subsequently fell back and obviously because they didn't get sunk fairly soon like poor old 016 did might have gone on to have fairly effective careers later in the war but they weren't doing all that much in 4041 and no no one really managed to replicate the kind of chaos that Emden caused there were Japanese commerce raiders around believe it or not a few of them um, and one or two of the Hilfskreuzer also made it into the area with a degree of success and in that opening stage of the war on the Axis side of things, um, unless you count one or two as of the Hilfskreuzer just picking off merchant ships, the Japanese cruiser Higuro has quite the kill list for that early stage of the war, um, depending on exactly how you divvy up the kills. She at least has a cruiser and a destroyer to her kill count, um, both Dutch, and possibly, as I, depending on how you divvy things up, also... Um, Exeter. She certainly did most of the damage and potentially another destroyer as well, which is pretty good going for the limited number of naval encounters in that 40-41, very early 42 time period. Peter van der Most asks, in your video on the Nelson class you state the all front gun layer allowed for a shorter armoured belt. How does this work? Superficially the Nelson class actually requires an additional length of belt to cover the space between the second and third turrets. I'm assuming that on a conventional ABX layout, the length between B and X turret will be taken up entirely by the propulsion and secondary magazines and thus require an armoured belt anyway. Is this wrong, or does the Nelson layout allow for savings elsewhere? Secondly, when battleship construction resumed in the 30s, the Fre all but the French opted for a conventional layout. Why was this? Well, in addition to what I mentioned in the previous uh, response, there are a number of other issues. So if you look at a conventional designed ship, unless it's a really fast ship like a battle cruiser, but if we're looking at battleships, obviously, um, the space between B and X turrets or B and Y turret, depending on how you're laying out the aft turret, for a conventional battleship isn't actually entirely full of propulsion, etc., 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 and that's for a number of reasons. Um, partly, it's placement of stuff above the decks. Partly, it's a number of factors to do with the interaction between machinery and gun turrets themselves. So where you have your boiler rooms, you have to have the funnels coming up from those boiler rooms. And if you don't, you, know, you can trunk them, but that adds weight, which is you know counterproductive to the idea of saving weight. But once you've got those funnels come up with minimal trunking, you've then got to position the superstructure ahead of those funnels. And the superstructure, obviously you can't have the gun turret built into the superstructure. Thus, the entire thing means that by the time you start B turret, there is actually a significant space between the boiler rooms and B turret, and you can't have engine space for there. Maybe you can stick something like a secondary magazine in if you want, but it's not strictly required so there is some empty space involved there and there is also another good reason why you have spacing between your boiler rooms and your gun turrets and that is temperature the performance of your propellant will vary sometimes quite considerably if the propellant itself is at a different temperature in different gun turrets the US, for example, on the Wyoming class experienced this problem because they had a midships gun turret and the insulation that was wrapped around the magazine specifically to try and prevent this proved to be inadequate. And so they had huge dispersion problems with salvos, not because the guns themselves were inaccurate or anything, but simply because the propellant that was being sent up to the middle gun turrets was a higher temperature than the propellant that was going to the fore and aft gun turrets. And so that changed the amount of energy that those particular shells in the midships turrets were receiving. And so they went to a different location than ever, ever, all the others. And, you know, yes, you could insulate. Yes, you could even refrigerate. But all of that is additional weight, additional volume taken up. 
and it may not work or it could get broken um, so a lot for a lot of navies the solution was simply space them out have have a gap between the barbette and magazines and the boiler rooms so that the boiler room temperature doesn't affect your propellant now if you do this with a conventional layout for and aft you have to have two spaces you have to have a space forward um, to a and b turrets and you have to have a space aft to x or y or x and y turrets and so that's two sets of spaces and they've got to be armored as well because of course you're not necessarily going to be fighting 90 degree perpendicular all the time so you can't ha have as i said before a gap in the armor because then an angled shot if let's say you're approaching an enemy at 45 degrees if that gap isn't armored then a shot can come through and hit your magazines or hit your boiler room or machinery without having to pass through any protective plate so the whole length therefore needs to be armored Whereas with the all gun forward design, you only had to include one such gap directly under the main superstructure, as it turned out, and then you could terminate the armor as soon as you'd finished protecting your machinery, which is, as you can see, what they did with the Nelsons. And perhaps the best proof, if you like, of this is the French battleship building program, uh, which you mentioned. So when you look at the Richelieu's and the slightly revised Clemenceau, which obviously wasn't quite finished, Compare it to the Gascogne, which is the same hull, but with a more conventional fore and aft layout, one quad each end instead of two quads forward. The French found that just to perform that m movement of the turrets um, up from one from having two forward to one fore and one aft, that required them in order to maintain the armor protection and for the reasons I mentioned just now and in the previous answer to lengthen the armor belt. So that's about as close as de to definitive proof as you can get because it is literally the same design, just with a redistributed main armor layout uh, and main gun layout, obviously. Now, at that is on top of the fact that, as I've mentioned before, the Richelieu in particular doesn't take full advantage of the, of the potential offered by an all-forward armament because its forward turrets are somewhat spaced out as compared to A and B turrets on the Nelson. Now, of course, there are reasons for that, but they could have shortened that armor belt even more if they'd moved A turret further back. But that's a discussion for the Richelieu class. There's also more general weight savings to be had because the all forward gun layout, it doesn't move the forwardmost gun, A turret, any further forward than it would be on a conventional layout. But what it does do is it means that, in this case, C turret, or uh, X or Y turret, depending on what you want to call it, is more amidships. And this means that, you know, amidships, it's the widest part of the ship. It can easily fit your third turret, or second turret in the case of the French. And it doesn't require you to maintain the width of the hull, or anything similar to that. Which, in turn, means that you can start narrowing the hull aft much more quickly and much more easily than you can with a more conventional layout where you have to keep a certain width of hull much further back to account for the necessary width for protection of the aft guns and their barbette and magazines and that in turn allows for a better hydrodynamic hull form and general savings on weight this is one of the reasons why even before the washington treaty compelled them to look at some really interesting weight savings for uh, the nelsons the british were already looking at a form of not quite all ahead but not not having aft turrets on things like the g3s and the n3s because of the weight savings and the improved hydrodynamics of the hull and it's one of the reasons why the nelsons were able to maintain the speed that they could could despite having only two screws and a relatively limited power plant and also why obviously as per certain reports from world war ii they were occasionally able to exceed that speed by reasonable amounts when they absolutely had to as for why people didn't maintain this all forward gun layout in the 1930s with the exception of the french well they almost did i mean the japanese had a very serious look at all forward armament ships before deciding you know what stuff the treaties we're going with the yamatos there and that really only leaves in terms of a vague attempts at treaty compliance the americans and the italians 
Now, for the Americans, they were actually, again, also very seriously looking at an all-forward gun version of the North Carolinas, back when they were looking at Quad 14s. That actually survived surprisingly long in the design process and was only dropped towards the end. And then, of course, you have the Italians with the Littorios, and although the Littorios did end up being hilariously overweight, they kind of tried, at least initially, to stick to the 35,000 tonne limit. But again, they went with a more conventional layout. But for the Italians, it was partly because they had all sorts of weird and wonderful schemes for weight saving and better defences and everything. So they thought they had a, a new thing going. And for the Americans, and pretty much the only other <laughs> remaining attempt at treaty compliance, it was partly a case that they wanted the aft firing arc to be open. The one restriction of this kind of layout that you see with the Nelson is that the third turret does have somewhat limited firing arcs and obviously no aft coverage. It's not a massive issue, but it is one that matters differently to different navies. But also they they thought that with the advent of newer, more compact machinery and other new technologies, the slight trade-offs that you had to make for all forward armament were no longer worth it because the benefits that you're getting could be enjoyed by a more conventional layout anyway using the uh, this new advanced technology. As for whether or not it would have worked well, or whether it did work, you know, look at comparisons between the conventionally armed, ship, uh, conventionally laid out ships that tried to follow the treaty, like the North Carolina and the South Dakota, versus um, something like Richelieu, which is, is not a 100% efficient implementation of the all-forward gun design, but is an all-forward gun design designed for the treaty era. Or even compare um, the speed, power, and armor and armament capabilities of the all-forward gun North Carolina variant versus the conventional layout North Carolina variant. And that brings us to the end of the dry dock for this week. Thank you very much for listening. Um, no particular channel admin at the moment, but a couple of things to note. Um, one, Tankfest. Um, so I will be there at Tankfest on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, the arena uh, slot that I've booked is in the afternoon, but so that's where I'll be in the afternoon, I guess, unless I decide to go elsewhere. But I'll be there all day. So that's Saturday the 18th and Sunday the 19th of September down at Bovington uh, Tank Museum. I currently don't have tickets for the 17th or the 20th. That's the Friday or the Monday. I will be in the area. Apart from anything, I've paid for the Airbnb. So I'm going to be there anyway. Um, Friday, I will probably be in Weymouth enjoying a rather nice excursion into my favourite bookshop. So if you do happen to be in the area for Tankfest and you happen to like naval history, I would strongly, strongly recommend that if you have some free time on the Friday between 10am and 4pm, you visit the Books Afloat shop in Weymouth. It is, so far as I've been able to determine by far the best second-hand naval bookshop I've ever come across, and the owner is also really nice. Um, the only thing is, uh, for various reasons, he doesn't take cards, so make sure you bring cash <laughs> or similar methods of transaction. I believe he does still take checks as well, if you can remember what those are. And the final thing, uh, which I'll be mentioning in a few videos in uh, upcoming over the next week or so, is, of course the release of Russian and Soviet battleships by Stephen McLaughlin, an excellent and, at the moment so far, pretty much only uh, reference for that particular branch of capital ship construction and some of the theoretical designs the Russians came up with as well, is coming up. In, uh, the release, date, I believe, is the 15th of September. It's being republished by USNI in collaboration with, of course, myself. And so, yeah, if, if you want it, go get it. I definitely think you should. Um, there's plenty of copies available. But also, for you lucky listeners, the US and I have kindly arranged a discount code. So if you use the discount code DRAC, that's D-R-A-C-H, that will give you 25% off the uh, new RRP of Russian and Soviet battleships. Of course, if you do choose to become a member of the USNI, 
then you can get 40% off everything. So that's good as well. But if you, for whatever reason, uh, don't want to become a member just yet, uh, then the code DRAC will obviously uh, save you 25% off of the RRP. And that will apply to any future books that I help to republish with uh, the USNI as well. So keep an eye out for those. So other than that, for the minute, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again in another video.